Welcome back everyone, it's Charlie. This will be my full Lord of the Rings, Rings of Power, Episode 7 video. There's a whole bunch of Easter eggs and references, so we'll break it all down. I'm doing videos for all the episodes, be sure to subscribe to get them, and careful for spoilers from the episode if you haven't seen it yet. But the biggest things this week, obviously, is the official renaming of the Southlands to Mordor. We knew what was happening, we're just kind of waiting for someone to actually speak the name. The funny thing is, though, is that Adar doesn't actually speak the name, they use a title card reveal. We also saw the Balrog of Khazad Doom for the first time as well, and turns out he's already awake. Like, they kept making all these references about King Durin the Third, not wanting them to delve too deeply, referencing waking the Balrog, like you want to avoid something really crazy happening in the future, which we knew would happen eventually just because of the events of the later books. But surprise, surprise, turns out the Balrog was already awake. And if it wasn't clear, this is the same Balrog that was involved in the creation of the Mithril itself. The Balrogs are also Maiar, just like Gandalf and Sauron, like the Celestial Choir of Angels, just a different type of Maiar than Gandalf and Sauron. They were corrupted by Morgoth a long time ago and joined his army, basically it's like his dogs of war. After his defeat, the ones that survived basically just went into hibernation, which is why the one in Khazad Doom basically hibernated down here beneath the Mithril. There isn't a big record about what happened with the Balrogs during the Second Age, so this is them just sort of adding this in for the events of the show, like it's not directly out of the books. They don't tell you exactly when the Balrog woke and started to kill all the dwarves in Khazad Doom, it's just during the events of the Lord of the Rings books in the Peter Jackson movies, Gandalf says, at some point the dwarves delved too deeply because of this mithril here and woke the Balrog, and then it basically laid war on them until they were all dead. Obviously, they're probably going to stretch that out over the course of the series, like five seasons, however long the show winds up running. Like, they're not going to kill all the dwarves off at the end of season one. But we will probably see the Balrog again in the season finale. It'll be interesting to see what they do with it during season two. If they're teasing it this soon, that means that things are going to be happening with it pretty quickly. One of the things that Sauron did early on when they created Mordor was gather all evil beings to himself. So now the idea is that all the people around the world that are still following Morgoth, still believe in him, will slowly make their way to Mordor. Also really important to note, they announced that they're starting work on season 2 right now. They said it's going to be way bigger, way more action heavy than season 1 was. I think they fixed a lot of their pacing issues. But they did confirm that actual physical Sauron in his fairer Anatar form will be played by an actor during season 2 on screen. So like we'll actually see Sauron walking around. It won't be like Sauron Watch 2022, like anytime anybody breathes at all, people wonder if they're Sauron. Even though during the Halbrand scene in this episode there were even more Sauron references, like every time he's in a scene there's some reference to Sauron. But the title of the episode is The Eye, which is a reference to the Eye of Sauron in Mordor, because they officially rename it to Mordor during the episode. The actual opening scene is the immediate aftermath of the eruption of Mount Doom, just blotting the sky out in the Southlands with clouds, covering everything in ash, pretty much indefinitely until somebody comes along and wants to terraform Mount Doom a little bit. Well into the Fourth Age, after Sauron is gone, they could probably eventually stop that ash from spewing into the sky, but it would take a lot, a lot of work. But the whole idea is that everything here is covered in ash, giving it this reddish cast to it. The title of last week's episode, Udun, is the elven word for this area inside Mordor, and in their language that also means hell. So in the episode, it kind of looks like they are in hell, so to speak. We get another one of Poppy's songs. A big part of Tolkien's literature is that there are a lot of songs through all the different books. The Harfoot see some of the collateral damage from Mount Doom's eruption, that's what all these boulders are very far away. When they take it as a portent of evil rising, that's 100% true because it's also a reference to Sauron, like the growing evil of Sauron. The stranger is whispering in Quenya, the language of the elves, to the tree, like he's speaking to the tree, trying to use his magic to regenerate the area, which takes a little while, but eventually it is successful. And I think this confirms that he's one of the Maiar, a wizard probably, we'll find out which one, I know there are lots of theories about which wizard he could potentially be. A lot of people think that they're bending time and space to make it Gandalf, but I don't think that they're speeding up the plot that much, and it'll be somebody different. Back at Khazad Doom, Elrond bargains with Durin III for access to the Mithril in exchange for supplies from the Elves of Linden for the next 500 years, and he's correct when he says he's never broken a promise before, because they kind of gave him an out with Gil-galad already knowing about the Mithril. But when he says 500 years, even though that sounds like a long time, because they're speeding up the timeline of the show so much, I don't know if that's also meant to cross over past the events of the War of the Last Alliance, when a lot of elves wind up dying or going back to Valinor and the Grey Havens, like there's still elves around after the War of the Last Alliance in Linden, but it's vastly diminished from what it is right now. The book timeline for the Second Age is way longer, but like I said, because they're changing the timeline for the show, it's a little hard to compare when things happen in the books to when things will happen on the show. 
Also, side note, after Gil Gallo, the next king of Linden winds up being Curdan the shipwright. He's the person who's basically in charge of the Grey Havens and the ship that everyone uses to get to Valinor. And they also confirmed that they're going to be doing his character during season two. So like another really huge character. We also hear about Galadriel's husband during the episode, which they'll also probably wind up doing on the show in a future season because she says the last she saw of him was before the War of Wrath and she assumes that he's dead, but he's probably not because we know that he's alive later in the timeline of the Peter Jackson movies. Also, if you didn't realize it, she's basically Elrond's mother-in-law. Her daughter with her husband winds up being Elrond's wife. And I think what they're saying in this current timeline of the show is that that hasn't happened yet. She hasn't given birth to her daughter yet and she hasn't gotten married to Elrond yet because Elrond's also never spoken of having a wife. And because the timeline of the show is so different from the timeline of the books, I think they'll just change when her daughter is eventually born. Like it'll be in some later season. Elrond names himself half-elven, which is true. He and his brother were born half-elves. His brother Elros chose to live life as a human being, founding Numenor, and Elrond chose to live life as an immortal elf. So one of the other jokes is that later in the timeline, Aragorn is basically like his distant, distant, distant cousin many, many times removed. So him marrying Arwen is them keeping it in the family, so to speak, even though they're very, very, very distantly related. During the third mentions the Valar Aule again, referencing the creation of the dwarves. That is the Valar who created the dwarves initially. All of his metaphors here, his speech about the rock, the fire, their mortality as dwarves, everything fading to ash eventually, is meant to be a reference to Mount Doom and Mordor in the episode because of all the literal fire and ash. But it's also a reference to the Balrog of Khazad Doom that eventually becomes their doom, so to speak. Most of his speeches with his father about Mithril in all the episodes so far have been about not tempting fate, not delving too deeply. The shadow that will get them eventually, burn them in the mountain, is basically a reference to the Balrog. I think all their scenes together, especially when he gets really pissed off at him later in his wife's speech at the end of the episode, is just meant to reference that during the course of the series, during the fourth, will eventually choose to ignore his father's wisdom after he dies at some point and becomes king of Khazad Doom himself. He'll be the one to say, okay, everybody, it's fine to mine Mithril again. Everybody open the mines. Like the easiest way for him to get around that problem is if his father dies. Obviously he loves his father, so it's not like he's going to have him assassinated or anything like that. But I think they're just setting up that his father dies and he does become the next king. And that's how they get the Mithril to the elves. When they keep making metaphors about light in Mithril, the whole idea is that the Mithril contains the light of the Silmarils and thus some of the last remaining light of the two trees. And that's how it's also able to reverse the blight. The Blight isn't something from the books, it's something that they introduced for the show, but it's meant to show you Morgoth and Sauron's growing darkness over the earth. And very literally, Morgoth actually poured his evil power into the earth. Later in Morgoth's timeline, before his final defeat, he'd actually poured too much of his power into the earth, like he'd been darkening the earth, so to speak, with evil, and eventually was trapped there. Sauron also has a similar type of problem later in the timeline, too. He has all this power as a Maiar, but eventually in the downfall of Numenor, he winds up losing a portion of it, so he loses the ability to change form, and thereafter, he just wears the armor all the time. So even Sauron, Morgoth, Gandalf, these other angelic beings have crazy levels of power. They do have a finite level of power. We see Galadriel's basically given up at least temporarily on the Southlands. There's nothing they can do about the environment now. Like I said, maybe long time in the future into the fourth age, they could do a little bit of terraforming with a lot of magic and a lot of people working. But the whole idea is that they're moving the Southlanders to this safe area outside the influence of Mordor and what's happened with Mount Doom. That's all meant to be an Easter egg for Gondor. The actual place they say they're going, Pilargir, is the eastern port town that Numenor sets up initially on Middle-earth that eventually becomes the port town of Gondor. So like around this area, they're going to be creating the kingdom of Gondor eventually. When Galadriel says there were no orcs when she was Theo's age, technically that's not true. There were orcs, but they all looked more like Adar, more elvish. Then they slowly mutated over time, over the centuries, to what their modern appearance is. But they're still the same basic race of what they refer to as the darkened elves, like elves who are perverted by Morgoth's darkness. That got started before the call of the Valar, before Galadriel was born. They reveal that Muriel has lost most of her vision. There's no record in the books about what happened later on in her life here. Most of the books during this era are focused on what Farazhan did and what happened with the downfall of Numenor, not so much on her. When Sadok is telling Meteor Man about navigating through the Greenwood to find where he's going, the Greenwood is what they called Mirkwood before it became Mirkwood, which eventually we saw during The Hobbit. But the place that he's trying to find, if it wasn't clear, is Mordor. It's the same place where everybody is converging on. 
basically at the end of the episode, the Harfoots decide that they're going to join him too. And that's just a way to keep them in the story during season two, because obviously the plot is moving towards that area. When Galadriel is talking to Theo about how her brother died, he also asks if she's lost kin before. That's a reference to the elven kin slang. There were multiple kin slangs, most commonly associated with the sons of Feanor each time in their quest to retake the Silmarils from Morgoth. There were three separate ones, all from the sons of Feanor. When she starts talking about her missing husband, I think the idea is that when they reveal him, they'll just say that he was held captive by some other force like Adar's forces or somewhere else in the world, and that's why he hasn't tried to come back to Linden yet. Elrond jokes with Durin about letting him win their contest, which a lot of people actually thought after the scene, just the way they played it, oh, it seems kind of like he's letting him win. The whole thing with the dwarves having secret names is a reference to the way Durin's folk choose their new kings in the books. They've kind of changed it a little bit for the TV show, but the whole idea is that Durin's folk believe in reincarnation of their original Durin, so when they name a new king, they rename them to Durin, and it's like the person that they believe to be the reincarnation of the original one. So usually they don't introduce a new Durin until the previous one died, which is why it's weird that there's two Durins on the show right now. But the idea is that the name Durin is ceremonial, so when each new successor, each new reincarnation of Durin is found, they rename that dwarf to Durin. So the secret name would have been the names that they were originally born with, implying that Durin IV had a different name when he was born. You also see the river on Elrond's shirt much more clearly here. That's probably the same river Syrian that's on Gil-galad's neck piece and on Adar's armor. So you have like all these different elves that reference this particular river. It was like the main river running through Beleriand during the first age. That was this ancient mighty city of the elves, like the first big city that they had on Middle Earth that wound up sinking during the war with Morgoth, sort of like a precursor to the sinking of Numenor, but for different reasons. A lot of areas around the world sinking into the ocean. Then even though there's this whole conflict with Durin and his father over the Mithril, I think the idea is that he'll die and Durin the fourth will become king and that'll clear the issue. But I think one of the other reasons why he's so pissed off here when he says that Elrond is like a true brother to him is it is more so a brother than his biological brother, the king's other son. Because they do confirm later in the episode that he does have a brother who could potentially threaten his claim to the throne. Getting very Game of Thronesy inside Lord of the Rings. That's like literally what's happening on House of the Dragon right now. They bring back the evil looking women who seem like human mages following Morgoth and Sauron. Technically everyone who follows Sauron during this period would be a worshiper of Morgoth. Like even Sauron worships Morgoth. The whole idea is that during this whole period while Morgoth had been defeated is that Sauron was like their temporary boss until the prophecy about Morgoth's return eventually came true. Like there's this long running prophecy that eventually he'll break free from his prison and eventually return to Middle Earth. But they do confirm that they're magic users. They seem like they're human, but I think what they're doing is they're trying to set them up for a bigger arc during season two, future seasons. Like the whole idea is that you have Sauron as the true big bad, but if he's going to be appearing in his fair form next season, they're not going to play him like a villain, like he'll be pretending to be their friend. And while that's happening, they'll just have somebody else be the antagonist. Like in the way that Adar is one of the main antagonists of season one, I think this group of women will eventually become bigger antagonists in future seasons. When we go back to the Numenorians camp here, the tree on the banners here is a reference to the white tree of Numenor. It's the same type of tree as the two trees of Valinor. It just doesn't have the same light that those two trees had. And eventually the same as the white tree of Gondor. Obviously exactly the same as the white tree of Gondor. The reason why Arondir bows to Galadriel, even though he comes from a different group of elves, is mostly out of respect for her high station. Like she's far older than him and she was the leader of the elven northern armies. So it'd be like a general showing up in front of an officer. They make a lot of references about the Numenorians returning with a greater army and taking the Southlanders to a safe place just outside of Mordor. Like I said, that's just a reference to eventually what would become Gondor. When Muriel tells Galadriel no one kneels, that's also a reference to the return of the king when Aragorn, Muriel's distant relative, great-grandson many times removed of Elendil, says the same things to the hobbits after they kill Sauron. And like I mentioned earlier, I think one of the things that will happen when they go back to Numenor and they find out that she's blind is that Farazone will try to use that against her and usurp more of her authority. And they'll just tease more the division between the anti-Valar sentiment on the island and the faithful. The faithful will be the ones that return in force in future seasons. There's a really funny Hobbit reference here too. When Nori's father says that Harfoots don't slay dragons or dig for jewels, that's a reference to the events of the Hobbit very literally with Smaug in the Eye of the Mountain, the Arkenstone. He's not wrong either. Harfoots didn't do that. Bilbo was a Hobbit, but they are genetically related to the Hobbits. When Galadriel basically says she's reporting things to Gil-galad, that's their way of roping in the elves to the larger Mordor plot in season two, because up to this point, Gil-galad had this big thing about trying to avoid getting the elves involved in that, being more concerned with the Mithril, the Forge, and the dying of their inner light, their immortal souls. 
She also says she's taking Halbrand back to Linden to be healed by the elves, and when she says fate has one more raft in store for them, I think that's meant to be another Sauron reference, because way later in the Peter Jackson movies, when she's talking to Frodo, she also mentions the tides of fate, talking about their fight against Sauron, so there's all these references to rafts in the middle of the ocean and what happened with them in the beginning of the season. And a lot of it has to do with her talk about Sauron. Also, you have the whole thing with Halbrand being taken to the elves very literally, Sauron tricking the elves while he's in his Anatar form. So they really, they really want you to think that Halbrand might be Sauron. But like I said, it could all be a misdirect. We'll see. We're still on Sauron watch right now. Like literally any human being says anything on the show, people are like, could this be Sauron? Thankfully, the showrunner did say that during season two, they'll have an actual actor portraying Sauron specifically, and it'll be his fair form, which is why I say the Anatar version of Sauron. So it won't be like a big mystery during season two. It'll be like that guy right there. That's Sauron. I already talked a little bit about the big reveal at the end of the episode that the Balrog of Khazad-dûm is already awake when they throw the leaf through the shaft. We'll see how much they do with the Balrog in the finale and what happens with it in season two future seasons because we don't know a lot about what the Balrogs were up to during this second age. Only that at some point during the second age, the Balrog waged war against the dwarves of Khazad-dûm and eventually wound up killing them all. The actual end of the episode is the official renaming of the Southlands to Mordor, but like I said, Adar doesn't actually speak the words Mordor, they use the title card when they're showing you what it looks like now with Mount Doom in the backdrop. And also in the title card here, they shift from light to dark when revealing the Mordor title to show you how it's literally darkened the skies above Mordor. So unless there's some really big twist in the season one finale, it sounds like Adar might survive into season two and just continue being one of the villains on the show. One of the many villains. But if you spotted any other Easter eggs and references during the episode that I didn't talk about in the video, just write them below in the comments and my full episode 8 finale video will post next week after they release it. Everyone click here for my House of the Dragon episode 8 video and click here for my full Marvel Werewolf by Night breakdown video. Thank you so much for watching, everyone stay safe, and I'll see you guys in the next one.